Okay. So y'all keep uh, y'all can keep getting getting food. Did you say fatter? <laughs> yeah. I've tried. Okay. Uh, it's, oh. I, I can't teach with this because it doesn't have the bit. So that's my excuse. There. Well, hold on. Yeah, it's about to fall. <laughs> if I could wear it here, it'd improve my look, but. Okay. Well, a special uh, welcome to any guests or visitors we have. Again, thank you so much for uh, y'all's love and uh, just the big family we have out here. We have literally no biological kin west of Dallas Fort Worth. And uh, yet we move out here and, and just all of a sudden have hundreds of people. Our family exploded uh, overnight. So thank you so much. Let's pray. Lord God, we bow before you in gratitude and we thank you for the love that you've poured out upon us. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving in Lubbock and serving this great congregation to serve your holy name, to, to take what is written and unchanging and to, through the Holy Spirit, apply it even in the, the church of, of our modern age. I thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the friends of this church, not, not members, but close friends of this congregation who are true brothers and sisters in Christ, who go to other congregations. We pray a blessing over their ministries. Today we pray as we, we wrap up this segment of 1 Corinthians 14, your Holy Spirit would guide us and to see what you were saying to that church in Corinth so long ago and what you're saying to the church today. We pray this in the name of Jesus, one through whom we approach you on the Lord's day, rightly with proper sacrifice, blood covering, bringing before you what you find most pleasing. And that is the very life and essence of your only begotten son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. First Corinthians chapter 14. Just a reminder, this is the fourth of the five issues addressed in this letter to uh, the church. And it has to do with the way they gather on the Lord's day. So uh, we'll begin with reading the word, beginning with verse 26 through verse 40. And may God's blessing be added to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his word. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at least three, at most three, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For if you can, for you all can prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anybody thinks he's a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. 
Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Ask Gary. All right, so uh, just a reminder as we look back on this issue, the, pro the problem is Paul is writing a letter saying your, your worship hour, that, that worship hour, your, your day of, of worship, your gathering on the Lord's Day is actually doing more harm than good, which is not what a church wants to hear. But it is good that they're getting a letter because it's, a, it's a, an acknowledgement that they are a true church. So again, it's, it's a mixed bag. If you get a, a letter from an apostle, that's good news and it's bad news. It's good news because Paul says, you're really a church, but it's bad news because you're getting a letter and the consultant has come in. The IRS is coming to audit you and going to look down and, and go through your files and say, these are changes that you must make. These are changes out of love. These are changes that God sees in your life that must adjust. You know, one of the things God, part of God's judgment to the uncovenanted is that he doesn't interfere with them. He doesn't discipline them. He leaves them alone and he lets them go along their own way. Isaiah chapter 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone our own path. But the, the penalty that has brought us peace and brought us salvation was laid upon him, our good shepherd, Jesus. So even, even the sheep go astray. But by God's grace, he brings us back. By God's grace, he has prepaid for all the rebellions of even his church. And so this, this word is written to the church in Corinth, but it's also sealed in Scripture for all the churches of all the eras to read and to learn. Six things we've covered so far about how the church should gather on the Lord's Day. Paul says you should be a woman or a man. Gather accordingly. Number two is make the Lord's Supper central. Uh, I know a lot of congregations uh, celebrate the saving acts of Christ through the sacrament quarterly or monthly. But this is one of these, this is one of these texts. It doesn't say to do it every week, but the fact that Paul has it so high up on the, on the priorities of the church life, um, that's where our congregation and many others have assumed that to mean you should receive the Lord's Supper every time you gather, especially on the Lord's Day. I've noticed there's a lot of Baptist churches that are shifting and Bible churches that are shifting to weekly uh, sacrament. Number three is the most important person attending church should be the Holy Spirit. So today's, today's teaching is about orderliness, but that is not as opposed to the ministry and activity of the Holy Spirit. Number four is the importance of having a healthy body. Uh, Jesus says, for instance, if you have a struggle or an issue with one of your brothers or sisters, before you go to the altar, what should you do? You should go to that person and make amends. You should recon be reconciled to your brother and sister in Christ. And that's Jesus. Jesus says throughout all of the, of, the, of the teachings about the unity of the church, the health of the church is very important. The relationships between the members of the body are very important. And we, we went into detail on that a few weeks ago. Number five is that the greatest of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of love. And the church needs to pursue that with great open-heartedness to beg God to pour out the gift of love. Now that's one, because that's the greatest of the gifts and that's the most forefront of God's heart. But number two is if you look at a bar, two bar graphs, you've got love and you've got truth. You cannot handle truth if the love has not grown. A church that's all truth and, and no love becomes legalistic. Yeah. But a church that's all love and no truth becomes carnal. And so uh, Jesus, Jesus is the embodiment of both. He, he, he is the proof that love without truth is not really love. If I have a lot of lies hidden from my wife about my wife, do I love her? So, so love without truth is not true love. Truth without love 
is not the truth. You need both. They need to, they, we call them twin sisters. They come together. And so that gift is essential to the life of the church. So a church that doesn't have a lot of love cannot handle a lot of truth. There may be a lot of truth preached, but the church can't handle it. It can't catch it. It can't receive it. In fact, it produces almost a, 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 a sense of legalism where you're condemned into two parties. One party are the, the people who are proud. That, that oh, I, I check all those boxes. I'm a good person or I'm biblical as compared to these other people. Or the other form of legalism is the other condemning where you slip into despair. And you say, well, I'm not able, I, I, I've, made, I've committed these sins and I've done these things. And so a church that doesn't have love misuses the truth, not as a gospel expression of what God can do in the life of every sinner, but rather uh, makes us cold hearted, basically makes us into another form of return to Judaism or Islam or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or any other works righteousness religion. The last uh, week we looked at desire of the gifts. Paul says explicitly, beg God, pray that he would pour out gifts in the church, especially which gift? The gift of prophecy. Did you do that this week? I prayed specifically on Sunday morning in my office, on my knees, Lord, in addition to, to blessing me with the gift of preaching, grant me the gift of prophecy. And all I got was put on a rum. Da, 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 da. But I mean, you, you never know what's going to come out. And God's going God's to use that to make a contact with somebody that's, that's not scripted, that wasn't your plan. And it, and it takes, it's, it's like he's breaking through, silencing all the rooms and speaking directly to that person's heart. And today we're ending with the importance of orderly worship. Verse 40 versus verse 43. So verse 40 is the summation. Paul says, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. If you have another version, it may say proper. ESV? Decent. Decent. And in order. And in order. So that's, that's how it should be done. Then you look at verse 33, and we see, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Is there another word for disorder in your version? Confusion. Confusion. That's, a good, that's a good translation for it. So that's what's at stake here, order versus disorder. And I've written under these bold settings, uh, taxis is orderly is a military term. So we are supposed to gather orderly in order. So it's a military term. It means to be found in formation and prepared for battle, prepared to engage. Um, it's ready to stand and pass muster. There, there's a, there's a, a sense of, of uh, structure and training. And on the Lord's Day, we all have a role. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. And so ironically, uh, you'll hear people mock churches like that as the frozen chosen. Uh, which is, in, it's, like, it's like calling our U.S. military the frozen chosen. Like, say that to my face, you know? I'm kidding, but, you know, that's... Uh, a Marine could kill you six times before you hit the ground. So they're not the frozen chosen. They're ready for engagement. They're disciplined. Uh, they have a goal. They're here to do something. And so when people talk about a spirit-filled church, what they may actually be talking about is a disorderly, chaotic church. A true spirit-filled church has the gifts of the Holy Spirit functioning, but not in a disorderly way. Um. And so I want you to have that in the back of your mind that the actual word that Paul uses is a military term that when the church gathers on the Lord's Day, there is, there's an engagement occurring that requires your attention. And it requires you to learn over time how to do that. We aren't natural at praying. We have to be taught how to pray. We have to be taught how to forgive. We have to be taught how to uh, read scripture in the Holy Spirit. We have to be taught how to do everything. That's why Jesus says in the Great Commission, not only do you go and make disciples and baptize, but teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus went to the woman at the well and said, the days are coming where you're, we're not going to worship God on that mountain or in this temple, but worship him in spirit and in truth. And so these are God's creation in your life. 
teaching you and your local church how to worship him. Worship is to be done in order, in orderly sense. That doesn't mean cold, because as we've, if you look back on one through six of the last several weeks, it's full of love. It's as you are. It's Lord's Supper. It's Holy Spirit. It's healthy, relational. Relationships are cared for. We're pursuing love. We're desiring gifts. But the last thing is we're, we are actually doing something. I think it was uh, Soren Kierkegaard who uh, pointed out in the 1700s, uh, he pointed out that our worship spaces trick the church into thinking that we are at the theater. That we are the audience and the chancel is the stage. And the preacher is a performer and the choir is performing for the audience of the church. So we get tricked. And other churches love that. They lower the lights, they give you a coffee, they start up the band, and, and you, you basically are uh, entertained. Um, Soren Kierkegaard mentioned that we need to be careful. He loves worship spaces, and he loves the, the, the architecture of churches, but he said we have to be really careful with that because the truth is the audience of worship is the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, are there to be worshipped. And the church members are the performers. Now, we're not hypocritically performing. We're not performing in the sense that it's just a performance. But we are actually engaged in something. So I want you to imagine when you, when you enter the house of God this Sunday, wherever it is you worship, that you are mic'd up. That you are limelit. That your heart is a stage. And God is wondering, what are you doing on it? That, that you, you're not an audience. You're, you're the one active worshiping God. And so, individually and corporately, Paul is saying, you know, when you, when you approach a holy God, the, our holy God, it is a big deal. And you don't want to do this disorderly. It's not right, it's not fitting, it's not decent, it's wrong. Luckily, because of God's grace, we don't die. What happened to Ananias and Sapphira? What happened to Aaron's sons who brought strange fire? Smote, right? Uh, to, to worship the Holy Lord wrongly is deserving of death. We don't think of that. <laughs> so it's, it's a very powerful privilege we have to come before his presence that he's been so gracious to continue to invite us to himself. I remember one, one time I was a, a youth pastor, I like to say I was a, a youth pastor uh, for 10, 10 years, one year. And uh, <laughs> there was this, I was the, the, the patron saint of ringtail tutors. I had these just, uh, just a whole ministry of sixth grade boys who needed Jesus really badly. And, uh, and we just had behavior issues all the time. And it was, it was the kind of group you like, you couldn't leave town with. And so, um, there's this one kid named Matthew and, you know, I had driven him all the way from Gainesville to Wichita, Kansas to do, it was just constant help for these kids. Anyhow, uh, he's, he's, he comes to church. I remember looking at him on the front pew and I'm sitting next to our senior minister, Mark, and I look over at Matthew, and I'm just trying to, like, engage our students. I want our kids to fall in love with Jesus. And I look at Matthew, and I just, he looks so bored. And I, I told Mark, I was like, man, he looks so bored. And he, Mark said, I'll never forget it. He goes, what if God's bored with him? <laughs> <laughs> what a thought. Uh, th there's There's been this tendency to minimize the glory and greatness of God. Like we take out chanting investments and creeds any anything strong um, because we don't want our God to feel so imposing. We're talking about God. He's supposed to be imposing. He, he's supposed to be impressive. He, you're, you're, supposed, you're supposed to kind of be concerned. Am I worshiping? Well, 
not what did I get out of that? Now, the beauty is, is when the church of God through Israel early on would come to worship the Lord through the priesthood, they would stand outside the tabernacle. The priest would go inside and somehow not die. I'm sure you've heard the stories. They would tie a rope around their waist. In case they did die, they could get their corpse out. And they would go in there and do all this, do, do the things prescribed in the law of Moses, which would later be fulfilled through Christ and then the ministry of the Holy Ghost in your heart, in your life, which you're able to do by the freedom of Christ all the time. And after that would happen, God would take his proxy, his priest, first named Aaron, and fill him with his spirit and send him out and stand among the throngs of two million people. And Aaron would look at the people who had just experienced the trembling of the earth because worship was happening inside that tabernacle. And the church was there to experience that, to see the greatness of God. And Aaron would walk outside of these people who were like undivided attention. And he would look at them and say, you have blessed the Lord today by your presence. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his, founds, his face, turn toward you and give you his peace. And so the, the Arianic blessing is, is, is a reminder that, yes, we do get something. But the ultimate goal is that we have already received everything in Christ. Sunday morning is not predominantly evangelistic. It's not to win souls. It's that Jesus' church would gather and give him what he's owed. It is right. It is fitting that on the Lord's day, we gather in the house of God. And frankly, that we don't cram it into an hour. I know I, I violate the shot clock every Sunday with my sermons. But what are we doing? So these are just some thoughts about the church gathering for worship. And the last thing Paul says is gather orderly, in order. The, the opposite is disorderly. In verse 33, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And literally, the word disorderly means not standing. It can't stand up. It's a wobbly stool. And so the church is unsettled, unstable, out of control. There's much commotion and tumult. So what people would call revivals, now, I do believe God can move upon a people and, and, and make them so convicted of their sin that there's emotional fervor and then their need for Christ and they see Christ as emotional joy. But the real signs of revival is found in the fruit of the life of the person, that people actually repent and begin to live the rest of their life. I'll show you a revival happen because I can still see it 20 years later in a person's life. So they're not leaping from experience to experience, which may actually be satanic more than it is of the Holy Ghost, but it produces in that person's life transformation where they are fruit-bearing for Christ. So disorderly worship is, is a real problem. Orderly worship is what, is what we're after. So I've written here just a summary before we get into the three segments uh, the gathered church on the Lord's day is entering the presence of the Lord. If you were to tell Isaiah that, <laughs> Isaiah 6, that there will be once a week, billions of people around the world entering the presence of the Lord, Isaiah would probably have PTSD flashbacks to the day he was in the presence of the Lord. And he saw the Lord's throne up, uh, robe, fill the throne, and Isaiah looks at God and says, I am undone. It, that's, like, that's like realizing you've been transported, like Star Trek, you've been transported to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and you have one second to think about what's happening to you. You're crushed under the weight of the water. You drown, you die. <clears throat> to, to be in the presence of God in the Old Testament was a terrible thing. Because you need a mediator. Um, and so the, the, the church on the Lord's Day is quite literally, through God's grace, entering the presence of God together. Uh, we are joining celestial beings. Angels are worshiping God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, one of the reasons women ought to just check the way they, they dress is for, for whose sake? He says, for the sake of the angels. Did you know when we gather on the Lord's Day in the house of God, we're not the only people there? Paul says there's other creatures there. You may not be able to see them, but they're there. 
And, and, and maybe what the commands in the Bible are here are not going to always make sense to you because you're thinking from a human perspective and you're not recognizing there's other creatures who are distracted or messed with by your behavior. Uh, at, on the Lord's Day, when we gather, we are proclaiming the death and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What a privilege. Who else is going to do that? It's the church. We are singing the Lord's victory through grace as darkness must retreat. We sing. This is more like a military exercise and less like a therapy session. Even though our good shepherd cares for all of our needs. Your needs do matter to God. Our relationships are important. We've seen that in the scriptures. But on the Lord's Day in the house of God when we're worshiping, it's much more like a military exercise. It's orderly. It's, it's focused. It's strong. It's, not only is it orderly in terms of that there's order in the room, but there's an order of worship. C.S. Lewis said the best order of worship, people were arguing over, do you do communion first, Lord's Supper first, or sermon first? And C.S. Lewis said, you know, the best order of worship is like the best shoe. You don't notice it. You're too busy walking. So the best order of worship in the life of the church is like the best shoe. You don't notice it. You're too busy worshiping. So you trust the order of worship so you can give yourself over and let the Holy Spirit lead you before God. And I know churches want to mix it up, probably because the Word of God is not interesting to them. And they want to mix it up every Sunday, and you never know what you're going to get. You walk in, and there may be the preachers put a bunch of chains on the, on the altar to talk about how God breaks chains. And the next week, he's got an umbrella. and the next, It's like a prop comic. And then, and then instead of a, a sermon, we're going to... We're going to have a liturgical dancing. And instead of a, it just constantly reinventing the wheel because there's a belief that the order of worship is a problem and not a safeguard. Isn't it interesting that Paul ends with all this? After he talked about like the fantastic nature of the Holy Ghost and he says, all right, now all that's true, prepare for battle. Join the ranks, stand tall, lift up your sword, step forward like you've been trained to do. This is the opposite of an Easter egg hunt. Paul says that when we come together, he says uh, there'll be hymns, word of instruction, revelation, tongue, or interpretation. But he uses the phrase, uh, when you come together, everyone has, everyone has. So there's a sense of communal sharing. So it could be something you're, you have been gifted to bring, or it could be something you are gifted by the Holy Spirit to enjoy. But what that means is, um, take, go back to Kierkegaard's uh, notice about worship spaces. The true choir is the congregation. You know, God, God wants a singing church. So we're not being sung to we're singing with. Uh, Daryl, Daryl's our fantastic organist, and he, he's pointed out that he learned, was taught a long time ago that if you can't lead him singing, it doesn't matter how good you are at preludes and postludes, you can't lead him singing, you can't do this job. Because the church, the, the congregation, or the choir is not the surrogate for the church. So the, church, the choir doesn't sing on behalf of the church. They lead the congregation in singing. So we're all involved in this, uh, we're going to, we'll move quickly to Acts 2. There's a few scriptures we're going to flip back and forth to. Acts chapter 2. This is St. Peter, and he's quoting the prophet Joel. If somebody thinks I quote the Old Testament too much, uh, you'll notice all of the sermons of Acts, 100% of them are preaching through the Old Testament. 
So Acts chapter 2, verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And so what Paul is reminding us here is that in the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not limited to Aaron or to Moses or to Peter and Paul. It's poured out on the whole church. Every single person in Jesus Christ is, is not only invited but summoned to approach God. Let his spirit be active among you and join the, join the chorus. Not the fray, but the chorus. Um, not the crowd, but the assembly. It's a big difference between a crowd and an assembly. I've written on the back, just for your notes, and we we gave this a few weeks ago, uh, a lesson I did a few months ago on the regulative principle. We have any Presbyterians in the house, this is your jam. But basically, the, the regulative principle is, uh, and I've quoted it here from the Second London Baptist Confession from 1689, the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by God himself and is limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men, nor the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. And... It's, it's the old joke. Uh, you've heard me say, you know, okay, you can worship God your way. I'll worship him his. That God has actually told us how to, how to worship him, how to approach him. So the scriptures are written to teach the church how to rightfully come to him. But when you go down this list of 11 things, you'll notice certain regulations. You know, only God is to be worshiped. That's why the church of God does not worship angels or saints or other creatures. We only worship the Trinity. We should worship at least on the Lord's day, and we should worship God with God's people. God's people. Uh, all the people should gather in prayer. We should read the scriptures, preach the Bible. We sh there should be sacred music, the sacraments and ordinances. It should be orderly. There is a dress code. As I like to say, wear clothing. Uh, number, number 11, though, is there's freedom. And so the regulative principle does not, the scriptures do not delineate every single thing that we could come up with, whether or not you could have air conditioning, the order uh, needs to be discerned through the local leadership. Um, you know, whether you use real wine or grape juice. So, as much as we're talking about order, we do need to re-highlight that there's a lot of freedom too. Okay, so, on the Lord's Day, the church gathers, and there are three things Paul is going to have to deal with. One has to do with the gift of tongues, one is the gift of prophecy, and one is the role of women. And so the first thing he talks about is ecstatic gifts. And that's where, again, from last week, where the Holy Spirit moves in a person with vocal syllables back to God. And uh, I want to remind you in verse 39, Paul actually says, Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. The, the, if you're a biblical Christian, forbidding speaking in tongues is not good. That's a, a, that's a breaking of the scriptures. However, there are um, regulations put on those who are speaking in tongues. I told you all last week that's not something I've done before. But if it's something God chooses to do in my life, I would welcome it because it's from God. But it is a very private thing. It's a conversation in your spirit between you and God or maybe in a small group. And Paul was noting in the first half of this chapter that speaking in tongues was subverting prophecy, um, truth-telling. And so Paul says on the Lord's Day, speaking in tongues should be limited, um, maybe two or three per meeting. Each person should take turns, and there must be interpretation. So all of those things must be met. So if there's no interpretation... Uh, if you have a private prayer language, either keep it in your heart or um, do it at home or do it in your small group. But on the Lord's Day, it would be used to disrupt everybody else. For prophecy, 
uh, Paul says two or three prophets should speak. And that's, uh, again, prophecy is truth telling its words to the saints from God. It's biblically aligned words that God has brought forward. It's, it's wisdom given from God into the leaders of the church to share with the church. It's, it's, it's the kind of leadership the church today in America so desperately needs. What do we do? How do we, how do we face all the things that are changing in the world? If you just hand somebody a Bible, they're going to get overwhelmed. But in addition to an expositor of the Word of God who will teach through books of the Bible, you also need people who can look at a situation and through the Holy Spirit recall certain scriptures to say, you know, in 1 Timothy 2, it says, the, the, the gift of prophecy is the ability to take truth and apply it. To, to apply it in, in counseling sessions, to give biblical counsel uh, when it's needed. And it's also a gift given that may not be um, known to be used at the time by the person being used. So God has spoken, I know through me, uh, without me knowing it, to bless somebody, to encourage somebody, or to convict somebody. I've had somebody email me and said, how did you, how did you uh, know, you know, I was going through that? And I said, I didn't. Like, well, you said this. I said, I did? It's the old saying, there are two sermons preached every Sunday. The one I preached and the one people heard. And in that filter, it may be that, uh, that, that God is saying something. It may also be that they're hearing things they want to hear. Or it may be that Satan's speaking. Everything must be tested. And so the same thing with prophecy, with truth-telling, instructing through the word. When the leaders of the church stand up to address the church, there should be a limit, two or three per meeting. Can you imagine two or three sermons? Two or three per meeting. They should take turns, and the church body should discern. In verse 29, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Now, that could be the other prophets, or that could be all the church members. But there is a sense of listening to what's said, and not, number one, not just accepting it, but testing it. But on the other sense, when it's true, to let it affect you. You ever binge listen to your favorite preacher and not really listen to anything he's really saying? I just like the sound of Alistair Begg's voice. You know, I, I really like Steve Lawson or whoever. And, 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 and you, so you listen, you listen, you listen, but not take the time to meditate on the Word of God that was planted in your soul. A preaching church is made up not only of a, a preacher in a, the Word of God, but of a congregation who has the capacity to receive the Word. You know, how, how, how important is a, uh, a wide receiver who can catch balls to the quarterback? I know that poor guy from the Kansas City Chiefs starting his... I mean, how many balls did he drop? Who was throwing them? The best quarterback in the NFL, right? But the, the receiver couldn't receive, couldn't receive the ball. Hopefully they'll get that straight. Not to feel bad for the guy, but it's the truth. And so the church has the obligation to receive just as much as the truth tellers have the obligation to send. Number four, we know that spiritual leaders are to keep each other in check. Paul says in verse 31, uh, or verse 32, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. And so those who are in this form of leadership should, should be able to call each other out. Uh, to ask questions. What did you mean when you said that? I've, I have those kind of relationships. Now, if I, if, I, if I get an email from Ben Todd saying, you know, you said, or you, a call, hey, you said something last Sunday. It's really been not troubling me, but I've just kind of wondered what you meant by that. Well, I'm going to take that with a grain of salt. I'm not a grain of salt. I'm going to take that as true. <laughs> but if, 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 if some old boy comes in here that's visited one time and, and he's, he's wearing a pinwheel on his head and, you know, and he says, you know, you said something last Sunday and it really offended me. I'm like, seems like you're the kind that seems, or, you know, offended all the time. So God's going to lift up, if you're in the truth-telling calling, 
people that when they speak, boy, you listen. You're going to get feedback from all sorts of people, but specifically from other truth tellers, from those who are, know that burden of what it is to be responsible to lead with truth. God will give a gift, a checks and balance to one another. We won't turn there today just for the sake of time, but Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, God promises to lift up spiritually gifted leaders in the church. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you pastors and apostles. Of course, apostle, the apostolic era is over, but he's going to give prophets. He's going to give teachers and pastors and evangelists. And so he promised to do this. And so when you think of the orderliness of church, again, less chaotic and more like ready for engagement, God promised to give every true church people to do this work. If it's a legitimate church, God is going to lift up people to tell the truth, the biblical truth. Now everyone's favorite one, I know what you've been leaning for, is about women. Uh, Paul says, as in all the congregations of the saints, we don't know if that's going for, uh, up, back up to order or down to women, but whichever one. He says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So as we, as we end with this topic, oh, we're out of time. <laughs> as, it's my birthday, you know. As we, as we end with this topic, I just want to point out uh, some overarching things before we get down to the nitty gritty. The first one is the scriptures teach consistently what we call complementarianism. That may be a word you're not used to, but complementarianism is, is the biblical teaching that men and women are equal in Christ, but not interchangeable. We are, we are not tradable. Men are men and women are women, and we can be called to several of the same things, but we are not fundamentally interchangeable. Only men can be fathers. You know that. Only women can be mothers. Egalitarianism, on the other hand, teaches that men and women are interchangeable. So I ask you, which one is culturally dominant right now? Which one is biblically derived? It is not courageous to become an egalitarian church. It's not courage. That's called capitulation. This, the, the reason, I think, when we read this the first time, and I sat in my office and said, well, how am I going to teach this? It's not because of the scripture. It's because of our culture. Do you think this was an issue? This is an issue in African countries? So the dominant, just once you be aware, we are not in a vacuum. The dominant theme in American culture is that men and women are not only equal, which they are equal, but that men and women are interchangeable. And that's been the theme for a long time. And that's been one of the decisions of the mainline church is to capitulate. That is not biblically derived. And that's why there's so many scriptures like these that we struggle on, we choke on. So I just want to point that out and ask you, as I tend to do, to keep an open mind. <laughs> Isn't it funny? When I use that phrase, that's normally what a liberal will say. Would you keep your mind open by what, what I'm going to tell you? Well, I say as a, as a biblical preacher, keep your mind open to what the Bible says. Because it's going to be different from what we have been hearing the last 25 years. So, first off, when we look at a text like this, we need to remember that the Bible does not forbid women from being present, active, or vocal in the church. I know I just said women must remain silent, but if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, Paul himself, in the same letter, uplifts the presence of women. He's talking about dress code at the time. He says, every woman who prays or prophesies without her head covered, the issues is that her head's not covered, whoever does this without her head covered, 
It is just as though her head were shaved. The problem isn't that she's praying or prophesying. The issue is the way she's carrying herself. You'll see throughout the New Testament the presence of women being called and blessed for their participation. Some of Jesus' disciples, many of his disciples were women. The word does not forbid women from being present. God himself elected two women to, to meet the resurrected Christ and send them to the men. He did choose to do that. I'd like to add, I know that we, for some reason, recently we've made Easter all about the women knew better than the men. What were the women going to the tomb to do? To meet the resurrected Christ? No. To, to anoint a dead body. This is not a story about women knew, men didn't know. They went to preach to the men, and they didn't believe the women, just like the women wouldn't have believed if they hadn't met the resurrected Christ. How many apostles were women? Why? Because Jesus is a misogynist? Because that's not the order God chose. Why wasn't Eve made first and then Adam from Eve? She has a womb. Why not? Because that's not the order God chose. Women are a huge part of the story. It is through Eve that the promise would come. It is through Mary that the promise did come. Women have become as much inheritors of the kingdom of God as the men. But that doesn't seem to be enough for the egalitarians. Men and women have got to be interchangeable. Number two is the Bible does not forbid women from contributing, leading, praying, loving. Paul lifts up women as deacons, servant leaders. So what does the word forbid? The word of God for forbids saintly women from being used to create disorder, chaos, and sidelining their male compliments. This is the issue at stake. I know this is a difficult topic. The scriptures forbid women for being used for disorderly purposes, chaos, and sideline males. That does not mean that men can't be used for disorder, chaos, and sidelining people. So let's turn first. Aren't you glad you sang me happy birthday before I did this? <laughs> And I, I hope you all know my role here, and I'm not doing it begrudgingly. I happen to agree with Scripture, but my role here is to be the voice of the Bible. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You grabbing that for evidence, Mike? <laughs> I just want it right. <laughs> First Timothy two twelve. We'll have the statement, then we'll have the reason. The reason's more important than the statement for this. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man. She must be silent. Here's the issue. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing, that's through Eve, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So what Paul's doing is taking us all the way back to the first sin. What's the first thing that Satan's scheme was to lead the human race into sin? Some will say he'll question the Word of God. Did God really say... But that's actually not his first scheme. His first scheme was to address the woman and not the man. I don't know how old the earth is. I know that may cause a fight in this room, but I don't know how the old the earth is. I don't know how long Adam walked on the earth, but we do know that before Eve was made, he spent a long time naming all the creatures, stewarding all the creatures. That was his job. And God lifted up a helpmate for him. Adam didn't need Eve, but it was wrong for him to be alone. He was doing the job. 
but it was not ideal. And so when Eve comes along, she is here to support her husband's work. You know, one of Adam's jobs is when there is perversion of creation, he's supposed to straighten it out. And so if a serpent, for instance, comes up to Adam and say, hey, here's a good idea. Let's all rebel against God. Adam was supposed to take that serpent by his scrawny neck, rebuke him, tell him to straighten up, or cast him into the abyss. But Adam ends up following him. What's the first thing the serpent did? He spoke to the woman, not to the man. Now, where was the man? He was with her. That's what's creepy. She gives the fruit to her husband who was with her. So what Paul is highlighting here is the disruption of order. Satan's first scheme, his first scheme in the, in the New Old Testament was to flip on its head the order of responsibility. It was just as much a dereliction of duty from Adam as it was a, a grabbing of leadership from Eve. And that's what Paul's concerned with in the church. The disruption of order. And so Satan's first attempt, his first scheme is to disrupt and keep a backwards order. Where up is down, left is right, men are women and women are men. Have you noticed? How long has this taken? In our country. I was born in 1982. So basically, my lifetime, the flip. Uh, number two is the Word of God forbids saintly women for being used for chaos. First Corinthians 14, this whole chapter was written about the cacophony, uh, the noise, uh, the disorder. And the church, I've written here, the church is in an uproar, including the freedom of the women. Finally, a, a place where I can give my voice. Well, your voice does matter. Your prayers matter. Your singing matters. But not to be used to throw the church into this, this disarray. And that's the main thing about today, is the church was in chaos. And then lastly, the Word of God forbids women like in the story of Adam, to sideline the males. Where are all the godly men? Where are the men of old? Too many male preachers skip on, trip on their skirt on the way to the pulpit today. Where are they? Where are the biblical leaders? See, egalitarianism has, has supplanted that order. And, and I know that's shocking to hear. These warnings were given. They were given by even denomina some denominational leaders that were silenced. You do this, you're going to disincentivize all the males. Turn to Judges chapter 4. This is a, a great story of a strong and faithful woman, Deborah. Remember the story of Deborah? After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan. Who sold them? The Interesting. <laughs> the Lord did this. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in this place, because he had 900 iron chariots and cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried out to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of this person, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. 
The Israelites came to her to have her disputes, their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of this person from Kedesh, and she said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go and take 10,000 men of Naphtali. So Deborah is a gifted woman, leader in the, in the people of Israel. She tells this guy, here's what you need to go do. In verse 8, what does Barak say? You got to go. Where are all the godly men? Here's a woman who's rightly a prophetess giving counsel to a godly man, but it turns out he's not a godly man. He's scared. And so she said, very well, I will go, but because of the way you are going about this, <laughs> the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah sent Barak to Kadesh, where he went on from there. Um, look at verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down, followed by the ten thousands. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army and stay in, in, by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariot, fled on foot, but Barak pursued the chariots, the army, as far as this place. All the troops of Sesra fell by the sword. Not a man was left. And this is where you get this great story of Sesra going to jail. Not jail, but like this woman named Jail. She says, Here, here's a cup of milk. Go to bed. And what does she do to him? She drives a, tent, a, a Barnum and Bailey brother's tent spike through his head, a giant tent spike through his temple, and kills him. Then Deborah sings a great song in chapter 5. Check it out on your own time. But what we see even in the Old Testament is this story shows that God will uplift brave women. Thank God for brave women. But God will lift up brave women when the men won't lead. Thank God for Deborah. But this was a scramble in lieu of an ideal military order. So Paul ends this segment with a shocking call. It would have been shocking to their culture as well. That when you're approaching God, this is, ought to be done orderly. Now the question in a modern church like this is how do you apply these kind of texts? How do we love each other and honor each other? But the truth is the biggest image I want us to see is when we worship God, when we worship a holy God, he has a right to tell us what to do. He has a right to tell us how to form. And in lieu of strength, and in, in, when we don't have times of, of revival and fruitfulness and all that, he'll work through unideal means. But the normalization of unideal means is an issue. The church in Corinth was out of order and he was putting it back in order. He's going to do the same across all the churches, hopefully in the United States of America. It's a shock. It hurts our feelings. It's a surprise. But this is the word of the Lord. And so beyond this one issue, which I know has kind of dominated the room today, the real issue the real question is when we go to the Lord's house on Sunday, will we gather rightly? Will we gather like a unit, a family? Will we pray that what God's word has written continue to evolve here? Will we step before the holiness of God and realize we're doing something that is the most amazing of all privileges? And that's to be the church in the presence of our Holy Father. Next week, we'll pick up with the doctrine of the resurrection that will last for four or five weeks. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we thank you for this time together. And even on difficult topics, uh, we, we thank you that the truth doesn't change. We ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit would continue to build and revive and strengthen your church worldwide and that you would lift up and, and create, that you would uh, forgive, and that you would bear much fruit in the life of your church that's willing to, to be led by you. 
Uh, thank you for Jesus who paid for this and for the Holy Spirit who has never left us. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.